Brazil has always had superstars when it came to football. There has to be something special about them. It almost seems like everyone was born to play football and to play it beautifully. With five World Cup trophies, it's hard to argue that their football is not just beautiful, but also efficient. Regardless, if you want to up the ante, there have been special decades for sure. The 60s with Pelé and Garrincha, the 80s with Zico and Socrates, and more recently the late 90s to early 2000s with Romário, Ronald Fenomeno, Ronaldinho, Roberto Carlos, Kaká and Cafu. Two things can easily be noted when listening to these names. First of all, most of them are offensive players and secondly, one name was missing. And perhaps this abundance of quality forwards is what leads it to being forgotten so often. That name is Rivaldo. And today I'll not only tell you, but I'll show you why he was absolutely one of the greatest players of all time. He was born in a northern region of Brazil, which already set a precedent for the tough time he would eventually have trying to get Brazil to accept him as one of their star players. Despite his talent, most legendary Brazilian players had been born in the south, and that led half the country to show a certain resistance to having a northern player become so prominent in their squad. But regardless, I'm getting ahead of myself. As a kid, Rivaldo was shockingly poor. Living in a favela, he would experience hunger from a young age. Malnutrition would eventually have physical repercussions, making him bow-legged and even leading him to lose his teeth. To help out the family, he would spend his mornings as a teenager by the beach selling souvenirs to the tourists. Once that was done, he would go into the beach where he would play football for the rest of the day and where he would develop his game until at the age of 16 he started playing for the youth team of Paulistano Football Club. This was a special day for Rivaldo and an even more special day for his father. Since Rivaldo and his two brothers were kids, their father told them that one day one of them would become a football player and would save them from poverty. The magical story of rags to riches seemed to be forming day by day, but then disaster struck. His father, who he had always had a close relationship with, got into a car accident and passed away. Rivaldo has said he could not touch a ball for a month after his father died and really thought he'd never do it again. That only changed as his mother told him that he had to make his father's dream come true. That if he had always been by his side, he would for sure look over him on the pitch. So Rivaldo carried on. Unable to pay for the bus tickets, he would walk 10 miles to attend the training sessions. Oddly enough, the feeling of being overlooked has followed him since those times. Rivaldo has said in an interview that even back then, no one believed in him. That they said his teammates would be stars, but he wouldn't be able to make the cut. But as he said it himself, no one remembers the name of those supposed stars, but they do remember his now. At 19, he started his first professional season, playing for Santa Cruz in the second division, and despite only taking part in 9 matches, he would finish the season with 11 goals. After a substantially less prolific second season, he would move to another state and start playing for Moji Mirin where, after only one season, he would finally earn himself a move to a first division club, joining Corinthians on loan. After missing the final of the Brazilian Championship by a single point, despite being only three goals off of finishing as the top scorer of the competition, he would be on the move yet again, joining the reigning champions Palmeiras, proof that his value was finally being recognized, joining a team with players like Cafu and Roberto Carlos. In his first season there, he would help Palmeiras maintain their title, beating none other than his former team Corinthians in the final, where Rivaldo scored three goals, securing himself the third highest tally of the league once again. The following season, he would fail to win the league, but would have his first chance at an international tournament, playing the Copa dos Libertadores, scoring five goals in his first eight matches. It seemed like Rivaldo might have been able to carry his team to the top, but then, 16 minutes into the quarterfinal match against Grêmio, Rivaldo got a red card for stomping another player. With Rivaldo off the pitch, it was all downhill from there, as they conceded three goals in six minutes. Grêmio had in their squad the almighty Mario Jardel who would score three times that night and who deserves a video about him one day. What do you think? Are you familiar with the original Super Mario? After one last season in a disappointing Olympic Games with Brazil, where he would fail to score, taking home the bronze medal, Rivaldo, who by now had shown he wasn't the type of player to stay around too long, would move to Europe. Joining Deportivo de la Coruña for a single season, he would score 21 league goals and help Coruña get a 4th place finish, much better than their previous season's 9th. These performances caught the eye of many, but it was impossible not to make the comparison, as another Brazilian forward, four years younger than him, playing in the same league and with a similar name, had just managed 12 more goals than Rivaldo. Of course, I'm talking about Ronaldo Fenomeno, who by the end of the year would win his first Ballon d'Or.
Oddly enough, Ronaldo would leave Barcelona for Inter, and despite Rivaldo's lower numbers, the frequent comparisons only made the choice easier. Barcelona wanted him to replace Ronaldo. It took on the challenge and it started to question his success. Despite only getting 19 league goals in his first season, Rivaldo would lead Barcelona to win the league, the Copa del Rey, and the European Super Cup in his first season. After not being called up for the 1997 Copa America, Rivaldo got a shot at the 1998 World Cup. Perhaps his big money move to Barcelona was enough of a statement. Regardless, he would play every single minute of the tournament, notably turning the game against Denmark in Brazil's favor twice to get them to the semi-finals. And Zidane facing off, but with two goals by Zidane and a resounding 3-0 win, France seemed like the clearly superior team. The following season, despite scoring twice to ensure a point against Manchester United in the Champions League group stage, they would not be able to make it any further. Domestically, though it was different, Rivaldo had some of his most prolific times and totaling 23 league goals, only one less than Raul Gonzalez, plus an incredible 14 assists, he would carry Barcelona to their second consecutive league title. By summer, Rivaldo had built a strong case to win the Ballon d'Or, with his main adversary being a young David Beckham, who had taken Man United to the top of world football, making him the first ever English treble winner. Tough competition, but Rivaldo made the most out of the rest of the year. Over the summer, he took part in the Copa America for the first time. The group stage didn't go too well. First match against Venezuela, Brazil won 7-0. Rivaldo gets the last goal. Second match, Mexico, he gets a red card and that's it. He's suspended and only comes back in the knockout stage. But that's when things got interesting. In the quarterfinal match against Argentina, Brazil goes down early and Rivaldo comes to the rescue, scoring to level the match before Ronaldo gets the winning goal. Against Mexico, Rivaldo scores the second to get Brazil to the final, where he put the sherry on the cake. Rivaldo scores two and assists the third to get Brazil the trophy. This tournament would lead many people to start rating this year above David Beckham's, and if they needed any more confirmation, well, Rivaldo got back on the plane, came back to Spain, and started a new season, with 12 goals in 15 matches. Though he did have a dry spell in December, it was too late, voters had made their minds up, and by the end of the year, Rivaldo won the Ballon d'Or. Right after the Ballon d'Or, one major problem came up. Louis van Gaal insisted in playing Rivaldo in a deeper, more central role, while the player felt like he would always perform better on the wing. Regardless, the results were pretty mixed. Domestically, his performances started leading to much fewer goals, but in the Champions League, well... I guess it worked. He would score 10 goals, the only time he ever managed the double digits mark, scoring against the likes of Fiorentina, Arsenal and Porto in the group stage. He would go on to have his most impressive performance in the quarter-final match against Chelsea. After a 3-1 defeat in the first leg, as Barcelona needed a miracle, it would be Rivaldo would open the score sheet four minutes before the final whistle, the game had reached the draw, and Rivaldo had the chance of converting a penalty, which he would miss. As they would go into extra time, only 9 minutes into it, Rivaldo got the chance to convert a penalty once again, and that was it. Barcelona were now leading and would go into the semi-finals, where unfortunately Valencia would take the upper hand. With Van Gaal gone and Rivaldo back in his desired position and closing in on 29 years old, he would have his most prolific season, getting 36 goals in 53 matches, finishing as the second highest scorer of La Liga, once again, one goal behind Raul Gonzalez. In the Champions League would be excellent, getting 6 goals in 6 matches, including a hat-trick against AC Milan, which still would only get Barcelona a third place finish and an exit towards the UEFA Cup, where he would score 5 goals in 5 matches before falling to Liverpool in the semi-final. Despite all the goals, Rivaldo didn't win a single trophy that year, truly one to forget if it weren't for one match that would never be forgotten. Let me set the stage for you. Last league match of the season, Barcelona vs Valencia. Barcelona are 3 points behind Valencia with a better goal difference. Whoever wins gets the last available Champions League spot. Millions are on the table. 3 minutes in, Rivaldo scores an outrageous free kick. Then, Valencia get a goal back. And right before halftime, Rivaldo gets the ball outside the box and fakes a dribble, finds the space and shoots. Another screamer. One minute into the second half, Valencia tied the match once again. The rest of the match was a continuous fight for a third goal, when Rivaldo nearly scoring from a direct corner kick, but finally, 90 seconds before the 90 minute mark, with his back turned towards the goal, Rivaldo sends the ball up with his chest and BAM! Bicycle kick. 
incredible, a masterpiece of a performance, no words to describe it. After one last season with Barcelona, where he would only get 8 league goals, he would decide to leave, perhaps because Van Gaal had came back to coach. Over the summer he would play his second ever World Cup, his start to the tournament would be something impressive to say the least. In the first match he would score the winning goal, then he'd score in each of the following two matches as Brazil destroyed China and Costa Rica. In the last 16 and the quarters he would score both openers against Belgium and England to total five consecutive games scoring in the World Cup. But from then on, Ronaldo took the spotlight, scoring all three of Brazil's goals over the rest of the tournament, as they finally managed to get the much desired fifth World Cup. Five goals in a World Cup is impressive, regardless, but when you have a teammate scoring eight, including all of the semi-final and final goals, it's tough to stand out. Playing. Just to give you an example, he only played a total of 30 minutes during the Champions League knockout stage and still got the title. It's just not the same, clearly. So bad were his performances that he would end up winning the Bidon d'Oro, an award given to the most disappointing player of the year in Italy. From here on, well... Let's just say Rivaldo had a strange career. He was now 31 years old and would still play until he was 42. As you might imagine, he was all over the place. First, one season at Cruzeiro that turned out to be more like two months since Vanderlei Luxemburgo left and he didn't want to be there without him. Then, three seasons at Olympiacos where he would win the league title three times, scoring at a good rate still and being great help overall, even once scoring a goal on the last match day to secure the league for Olympiacos. After a dispute with the board, he would join AEK, honestly, just kind of to take revenge on them, eventually even showing four fingers to the cameras as they beat Olympiacos 4-0. Then came another odd transfer, three years in Uzbekistan, as you might imagine, they were paying him very, very, very well. Then he joined Sao Paulo, and after a not-so-great season, he would finish his contract through mutual agreement. When you thought it couldn't get any weirder, he would join the Angolan League for one year, before joining Sao Caetano, a second division Brazilian team, and leaving due to a knee injury. And finally, he joined his last-ever team, Mogi Mirim, one of the first teams he played for. They were now in the third division and his son also played there. As he retired, he stayed as the president of the club. Well, yeah, pretty weird. Rivaldo was one hell of a character and certainly a tough player to judge. Very skillful, taking into account his height, very prolific, he scored lots of wonder goals, but with a very introverted personality, he never achieved the icon status of some of his contemporaries. To further impact this, he also had a very disappointing trophy cabinet at club level, which could have been outshined by his international achievements with Brazil, but in a way, people forget to give him any praise for that, as his teammates constantly took the spotlight. He really had a tough time asserting himself as a legendary player and I'm very curious to see what you guys think. Now, getting into our ranking system, finishing is incredible, especially when it came to acrobatic stuff, but some players were substantially more prolific, it's a 9 out of 10. Playmaking is an 8 out of 10, a great assist provider, but once again his numbers just don't seem to match how spectacular he looked on the pitch. Dribbling was fantastic, just shy of the very best, a 9 out of 10. Speed and physicality is impressive, he's one of those players whose playstyle doesn't match his stature, very graceful despite his height, a 9 out of 10. Mentality, well, very reserved, determined and with incredible perseverance, I just feel like he lacked the personality to become a leader like some other players whose presence seemed to just be enough to take their teammates to another level, it's a 9 out of 10. Longevity and adaptability is a tough one, long career but a lot of time in really weird leagues, not that much time at top level, it's an 8 out of 10. Flair is simple, gracious on the pitch and incredible goals, a 9 out of 10. Trophy cabinet is tough as well, lots of trophies but rarely taking the spotlight, to an extent I don't think his Champions League should even be considered, given he barely played, it's an 8 out of 10. Lastly, icon factor, it's nearly the focus of this video. It just kept getting overshadowed, mostly due to being born in such an impressive Brazilian generation. It's a 7 out of 10. This totals out to 76 out of 90, leaving out the 10 points which are for you to vote for in the link in the description, please don't forget. Which temporarily places him here, 
And well, I'd also like to point out that I've added Maradona and the X Factor for all players. You selected only three of the players we've reviewed so far to get the prestigious GOAT level, and those were none other than Johan Cruyff, Diego Armando Maradona, and Cristiano Ronaldo. But only Maradona managed a high enough score to get the total extra 10 points. Adding all those points to the table, it ends up looking like this. Well, I hope this was uh, entertaining. Uh, the channel has been doing really great lately. I'm so, so, so happy. Like, genuinely, thanks to every single one of you. I have had one of the greatest weeks of my life and it's been really cool. Just thank you and see you next week. Bye.